The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I hope you are having a good day so far. Thank you for taking the time out to join us today for the webinar. I am Rohit Lohan, and I am excited to host the session today with Bill Pollock from Strategies for Growth. Bill is a well-known service industry leader. He is former president. Before that, Bill has worked as principal analyst in service management practice at Aberdeen Group and managing analyst in service industry at Gartner. Bill will be talking about building a best practices warranty management program using relevant KPIs. Before I invite Bill to the start his presentation, let me inform you that you can use the chat feature on your GoToWebinar window to ask questions. Today's webinar is for one hour, and we have kept the last 10 minutes for Q&A. Over to you, Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Rohit. I appreciate the introduction. I also appreciate uh, all of you attending uh, this uh, webinar today. I've uh, subtitled it as a special webinar presentation because it's a special data cut from an updated warranty management survey that uh, we originally conducted about a year ago. We have some new data, and what we're doing is uh, separating out what best practices organizations are doing to attain that level and keep that level. So I think it's going to be uh, very interesting, some very compelling findings as well. There's a lot of material to cover, and we'll cover as much as we can in about 35 or 40 minutes. But um, uh, you'll be free to download an archived copy of this um, uh, shortly after the webcast, as well as uh, a companion white paper that we've also written on the same topic. So anyway, I'd like to get started, and a good place to start uh, is really to talk about what's today's main focus. It's basically to, uh, to look at how best practices organizations are positioning themselves to do three things, drive revenues, reduce costs, and compete more effectively. Now, they're not the only three things that you need to do, but they are three things that best practices organizations are doing better than all others, and that's where we wanted to focus. But we'll be talking about other strategic actions and tactical actions that all warranty management organizations need to take in order to do as well as they can and certainly to aspire to best practices status. Uh, the survey, as I said, was conducted uh, on, in uh, last quarter of last year. And uh, we, we have about 11% of the total respondents who met uh, two parameters of qualifications, 90% plus customer satisfaction and less than five days claims processing time. Now, there are other parameters that uh, others of you might uh, choose instead of some of these. But what we uh, thought we would do is use the logic that if they're uh, satisfying customers and they're delivering on time, they must have some good processes in place and uh, they uh, are able to um, spend the money and, and the resources it's going to take to satisfy customers, so they probably have a good handle on costs and revenue generation. Uh, some of those are assumptions. Some of them work for uh, best practices organizations, but even those have uh, some of their problems, and we'll be identifying some of them a little bit later. So a good place to start is uh, to look at how these warranty management organizations are being run. Overall, from the total survey respondents, not just best practices, we see that about half are running as profit centers today, and another one-sixth, or 17%, are pure 100% service companies. They don't make anything, but they service uh, equipment and devices in the field. So that adds up to a total of 66%, which is pretty much what we're finding, whether it's um, our related surveys in field service management or reverse logistics, or what you might have seen published from some other research analyst firms uh, that are covering the services and warranty services marketplace. Uh, what we saw that was a little interesting among best uh, practices organizations, though, is that number is only 57% among the best practices organizations. And uh, I think that one of the reasons uh, that that's important to all of you is that not all of you are currently running as profit centers. Uh, what the data will suggest is that it's easier to make a profit, it's easier to be accountable, it's easier to satisfy customers if you're running your warranty management as a profit center. However, there still are some best practices organizations that are attaining those high levels even though they're uh, operating as cost centers. So we don't recommend operating as a cost center necessarily, but what we're saying is that if that's the, the position that you're in now, that doesn't mean that you can never attain best practices um, uh, status. 
so overall, what we've seen, again, from the total survey respondents, and uh, I, I'd like to present some of this data from the overall survey as a basis to compare where the best practices organizations uh, are situated. Uh, overall, two-thirds of warranty management processes are partially automated. So we see about half partially automated, uh, about one-fifth, 21 percent that are fully automated, and that adds up to 70 percent. What differentiates best practices organizations from all others, however, is their numbers go up to 80 percent. And what you can see uh, is that, uh, and by going back one chart, that 49 percent partially automated and 21 fully turns to 48, roughly the same partially automated, but 32 percent, almost a third, fully automated presently. So that's a, a big step in the right direction that best practices organizations have been taking. Now, one other thing that we notice, though, is despite the fact that they're at least partially automated, there still are one in five, 20 percent, that are using all manual processes. And that's the same as we see for all others. So that was a little bit surprising. But that, uh, that zero you see at the top of the chart for no formal warranty process, well, I, I think it's inarguable that if you're a best practices organization, you must have a formal warranty manage process, management process. So by putting all of this together, what we see is a picture where even among the best practices organizations, they're still running with Excel spreadsheets or tagging on to a CRM platform, tagging on to some other uh, a platform, or using post-it notes and, and paper and pen in some cases. Um, but uh, the thing is, it's, it's the process that needs to be in good shape. And it's helpful to have a process that's automated that will give you uh, additional time, additional strength and power uh, to uh, get all the processes done that you need to get done. Uh, and that's uh, one mark that's still dogging some of the best practices organizations. Now, one of the things that we wanted to take a look at among the best practices uh, is how are they working uh, in terms of uh, their annual warranty spend or an annual warranty budget. And what you're going to see uh, through a series of charts that we're going to be presenting is the remain the same or just the same uh, bar in the middle of a number of charts coming up is going to be 50 percent, 60 percent, 70, even up to 78 or close to 80 percent. What this shows us is that among the best practices organizations, there's kind of a stabilization or a plateauing that we're seeing. Uh, they've already increased the warranty budgets over the past year or two or more anyway. And uh, they're at a level, in many cases, in this case 60% of the cases, where they don't believe or they're unable to raise their annual spend anymore. So to take a look at this data in a little bit more detail, we see the 60% saying it's going to remain the same. And we see 35 percent, uh, just over one-third, who expect to increase their annual spend in the next 12 months. And only 5 percent that plan to decrease their spend, and that's only by less than 5 percent, a modest decrease. So if you do the math, and forgive me, I was a math major, the uh, expected um, increase in spend to decrease is roughly a ratio of 7 to 1. So we're, we're kind of seeing some um, uh, it's almost like um, uh, a paradoxical situation. We're seeing a very high ratio of increase over decrease, 7 to 1, but we're seeing that mainly more than half, 60 percent, are saying it's going to stay the same. So uh, think, if you will, if you look at the 35 and the 5 percent, wouldn't it really be nice if they were 70 percent increases, 10 percent decreases, and only 20 percent remaining the same? That would show a significant increase in spend over the next 12 months. So what this shows is just a modest increase in spend over the next 12 months. Still very positive, but on a modest level, not on an order of magnitude level. Then we took a look at what uh, percent of service revenues come from extended warranty sales. Now this is very important because we're going to see that uh, extended warranty sales is one of the key metrics that best, processes, uh, best practices organizations look at, more so than all others. We're also going to see that uh, the uh, benefits of that are significant and they're increasing year over year among the best practices organizations. So to get started here, we look at between 2% and 10% uh, of, um, uh, of uh, service revenues are currently coming from extended warranties among best practices, among almost two-thirds of them, 64%. 
Now, if you look at the bottom of this chart, though, when you look at the mean and the median, you see that there's a big skewness here. We've got 9% of the best practices organizations uh, who cite that more than 50% of the revenues are coming from extended warranties. And that skews this number very much higher. So uh, what this shows us, once again, is that while most organizations that we've seen from our last uh, original survey that we presented in a Tavant hosted webcast about a year ago, uh, the numbers look pretty close to this, except for the skewness at the bottom of this chart, which shows that there's a, a higher incidence of best practices organizations that uh, are citing that more than half of their service revenues are coming from the sale of warranties. Now, that's what I would say, that almost 1 in 10, 9%, cite that more than half come from extended warranties. But another thing that we want to look at is, is this changing? Has it been the same over the past 12 months? And what they're saying, 75%, is it pretty much has been the same over the last 12 months. But the good news here is that it has been increasing, about a quarter saying it's been increasing during that one-year period, and none saying it's been decreasing. So that's a 25% to 0% increase over decrease. Again, if these numbers instead of 25 and 0 were 50 and 0, and that 75 dropped down to 50, that would signify uh, a major increase uh, in uh, revenues coming from extended sales of warranties. This shows, again, just a modest increase year over year. Now, to back up a little bit, how important is effective warranty management to uh, the organizations that are in that line of business. Uh, you might think that that's a, an obvious question. If you talk to someone uh, who's in warranty management, you ask them how important is it, you figure you're going to get a 100% response that it is in fact important. We don't get that. What we do get though among the best practices organizations are higher numbers than what we've seen uh, from all others from uh, the original survey. For example, we see that 80%, more than three quarters, believe that effective warranty management is important to their operations. And what's really encouraging about this is that almost a quarter say it's extremely important. So what this means is that among that 56% that say it's very important, they understand their place within the overall organization. What else is important? Well, manufacturing might be important. Service is important. Customer service, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, logistics is important. But they know their place and they know that it's important. And these numbers are very much higher than we see either in our original warranty chain management survey or in other field service or reverse logistics uh, related surveys. But still, there are 8% that say it's not very important to the overall scheme of things within our organization. None say it's not important at all, but still, we have uh, a couple of the best practices organizations saying, you know, it's not very important when you compare it to some of the other things that we're doing within our company. But they're the aberration uh, more so than what we see in green at the top of the chart when more than three quarters say it's at least very important, then you can take it to the bank. It's important to the organization. In fact, it's even slightly more important than it was a year earlier. So here we see that middle bar, same importance as a year ago, 84%. Only 12% saying it's more important than a year ago. 4% saying it's less important than a year ago. So that ratio is 3 to 1, but again, it's a soft ratio. What it's saying is that by and large, it's just about as important as it was last year. However, keep in mind that when we did the original survey, we saw that the importance of effective warranty management was significantly more important than it was the year earlier. So many of the strides that have been taken by both, both pra best practices and all others have already been taken for uh, the large part over the past year to two years or two to three years ago. Once the um, main effects of the economic, real estate, and stock meltdown started subsiding and companies were able to cut costs then uh, focus more on generating revenue and then got back in the swing of things of satisfying the customer, uh, then what they found is that, all right, we've got our budget pretty much in line. Uh, we've got our uh, sales of extended warranties pretty much in line. What these charts show is there's still room for improvement. They're still targeted to improve, but the orders of magnitude of improvement that we've seen over the past couple or few years aren't resident uh, still today because many of the companies have already taken advantage of it and have made those steps. We'll see that a little bit uh, uh, longer, 
uh, as we go through these uh, drivers that are driving uh, the organization's best practices and all others to improve their operations, to improve the within the uh, marketplace. So anyway, what I wanted to show first was three or four charts just to serve as a baseline for the overall survey response. And keep in mind, uh, in particular, the 56 and 50 percent that we see at the top here, desire to improve customer retention and post sale customer satisfaction. What we see here is, first and foremost, overall, warranty management organizations of all types and sizes are focusing on the customer. The first three of the five drivers here are customer focused. And again, remember that 56 and 50. But then they focus on cost related factors. That's a secondary factor to them, but still very important. And that typically uh, rallies around product defect related costs and um, the, the mandate to improve service profitability, which is not necessarily a cost, but uh, based on uh, your ability to cut your costs and to generate revenues, that will uh, impact your profitability. And the third category here is revenue focused, and that's looking at service profitability and the mandate to increase service revenues. So keep this in mind, this is for overall. Now let's take a, a left turn and take a look at the best practices organizations. That 56 and 60 percent increased significantly to 68 and 60 percent. So that's a major increase among the best practices organizations. Not only are they focused on the customer uh, as their number one priority, they're more focused, more intensely focused on the customers than all other organizations. And while the chart gets a, a little bit uh, messy here because they're not all nicely clustered in a little package, um, we can't forget about customer demand for improved warranty services. That's still a main uh, component of the customer focus. But clearly what this says among best practices organizations is we believe that our focus should go squarely on the customer as our first priority. Uh, we want to increase our retention. We want to increase our customer satisfaction and deal with any issues post-sale that occur. And we want to improve our warranty services overall to meet customers' growing and increasing demands. So this is very critical because two or three years ago, we might have seen a little less intensity here. Uh, just after the economic bust, we would have seen uh, the mandate to drive uh, revenues uh, move up to a number two slot and uh, the various cost-related issues to go up to the number one slot because everybody was focusing on got to cut costs, got to cut costs, got to cut costs. Well, most costs are cut. M many organizations, particularly the best practices organizations who were pioneers in cutting costs post-meltdown, have cut all the costs they can. Now they're focusing on generating revenues. They have that pretty much under control because they've got the sale of extended warranties under control for the most part. So now they're able to get back to the basics, back to the future, which is focusing on the customer. But the secondary factors are also very important to best practices. They're the cost-related factors, product defect-related costs, and the logistics and reverse logistics-related costs. But what you'll see if you have a chance to review uh, this full um, slide deck uh, on your own later on, or if you look at the white paper, you'll see that the intensity here among best practices organizations is a little lower. These percentages are a little lower than for all others. And as I had just mentioned, it's because by and large, most best practices organizations have already taken the steps a couple or a few or even several years ago to cut costs back as much as they could. So that's why those numbers are lower. Revenue focus is virtually the same among best practices as it is among all others. So what you take from these two series of charts, first for all others and then for best practices, is they're all focusing on the same order of drivers. Customer focus, cost focus, and revenue focused. But the best practices organizations are more focused on the customer, more intensely, and they're a little less focused on cost because they've got most of that under control and they're equally focused on revenue because everybody's got to generate revenue, whether you're doing a good job or a bad job in terms of your processes, you've got to generate revenue. So what this means is that if you're one of the all others or industry average companies right now, then you need to focus on the customer first, then on costs, and then on revenue. And in order to aspire to be best practices, 
you might want to put a little extra effort into that focus you put in the customer because that's what best practices organizations are doing. And if you're not, any gap that exists between you and them today is only going to get larger over time. So to, to look a little bit backwards from what's driving the market, let's take a look at what the greatest challenges are that are facing warranty management initiatives today. And this is among the best practices organizations. Well, what we see here is no real standouts, nothing that breaks out um, and says, hey, this is the number one challenge. What we do see, though, is when you get an, an array of numbers from 40% down to 32% who are saying that each one of these five challenges is one of the top three challenges that we're facing today, then you're seeing that there's a, a mix of challenges that are hitting just about everybody, whether they're best practices or all others. And while nothing is a standout challenge, all of these remain a challenge. And think of it this way, uh, among these five, there's no less than one out of three best practices organizations that says this is a major challenge that I'm facing today. And for the most part, these are the same challenges that your organizations are facing. So you're all facing the same thing. What the differentiator might be is the technology adoption and uh, the use of uh, a good KPI um, program uh, to measure and track your performance so you can target improvements, make the improvements, and then measure how successful you've been. But there are other challenges too, and what I wanted to do before we leave the challenges area is uh, to, to make a couple points here. Many other organizations, some of the ones that I have been with in the past, uh, will only show one chart uh, that shows the top five challenges, the top five drivers, the top five strategic actions. What I wanted to show you was the next five. And what we see here is that at 28%, that's more than a half uh, between, uh, I'm sorry, more than a quarter, between a quarter and a third saying that the sales of extended warranties and cost recovery from suppliers are a major challenge to us. They're one of our top challenges. So again, while these didn't make the cut for the first chart, they certainly are important enough to still look at, uh, as are the next uh, series uh, of charts here. For example, uh, the reverse logistics management at 12%, that means one out of eight of best practices organizations thinks that reverse logistics management is a challenge for them. And the last two here, uh, warranty reserve accrual management and finding reliable suppliers, one in 12 of best practices, and slightly more among all of those others are saying that this is also uh, a top challenge for us. So don't just look at the top lines, don't just look at the uh, primary factors or drivers or, or actions that need to be taken, you've got to look at the secondary and in many cases the, the third or tertiary uh, factors as well. So. Overall, what we were looking at when we look at the total survey respondents from the original survey is a majority cite only one current strategic action as being uh, uh, one of the top ones, and that's to develop or in, to improve the metrics or the KPIs, the key performance indicators that they use for advanced warranty chain analytics. This is in sync with just about every other survey that we've done. That number is within a couple points of what we get among the field service management um, respondents from our other survey, from our reverse logistics uh, respondents, and uh, we just conducted a, a survey uh, uh, among the UK database. The number was a little bit higher, but in all cases, developing and or improving the metrics is the number one strategic action that's currently being undertaken. Now, there are a whole list of other actions that are being undertaken here uh, by uh, the uh, industry average, by the total survey respondents. And rather than look here in specific uh, numbers, let's take a look at best practices and then compare them to these numbers. So for best practices organizations, strategic actions currently being taken, again, the only one above the 50% line, 56%, developing or improving the metrics or KPIs used for advanced warranty chain analytics. Then when we look down here, we see a similar array of other strategic actions currently being undertaken. So I wanted to take a look at them and see what the deltas are, what the differences are between best practices and all others. So if you look at the green arrow pointing up, what that shows is that there are three of these strategic actions currently being taken where best practices organizations are not an order of magnitude, but slightly to somewhat higher than uh, the total survey base. That's what they're doing today. 
They're focusing on the metrics. They're focusing on fostering a closer working collaboration between product design and service. And they're focusing on implementing a claims review process to curb fraudulent claims. So this doesn't mean that the other uh, KPIs and, and strategic actions are not important to them. What it means is uh, something a little different, and I think this will become clear here. We see the red arrow pointing down for areas where best practices organizations uh, less are saying that they're taking these actions than the total survey respondents. And that it looks like um, uh, a cluster of just about all of the factors underneath KPIs where uh, they're not focusing as much on this as all others. So the reason uh, it should not be surprising if you sit down and think about it. When you look at streamlining parts process, uh, return process to improve overall efficiency, why are they not focusing on that this year? Because they already did it last year or the year before or five years ago. Why are they not restructuring for improved warranty management oversight and accountability? It's because they already recognized years earlier that we need to have a senior executive with accountability for our warranty management operations. That's why they're not focusing on those as much as all others. But what are they focusing on? They're focusing on a closer working collaboration between product design and service because that's something that everything else seems to be either easier to do or more important to do in years past. And now all of the, the tough things, all of the, uh, the important things, all of the top of mind things have been taken care of. Now what we have to do is make sure that our service and our product and manufacturing uh, uh, components within the company are working together. And we also have cleaned up our act. Now what we have to do is clean up the markets act by um, improving our claims review process to curb any fraudulent uh, claims uh, that are coming from the marketplace. So these numbers might have looked surprising if we didn't see these arrows and hear this explanation. But the explanation, I believe, is very clear. And it's because, um, for the most part, best practices organizations have already done many of the things that all other organizations are still trying to plan and trying to get accomplished. So what we've seen in terms of the KPIs, the most important action, is that best practices organizations are currently uh, looking at six of them, a majority, 50% or more, are looking at six KPIs to measure their performance. And number one is customer satisfaction. That's always number one in all the surveys that we do. What was interesting to me, though, in this survey is that at 88%, that's about the highest number that we've seen. Uh, it's five to 10 points higher than many of the splits that we did among the field service management survey results uh, for uh, customer satisfaction being um, a preferred KPI. So what that shows is that it's got the head in the right area. They know where they have to take actions, and they're looking pretty much at the right KPIs to measure. But when we compare this against all others, what we see is that there's a higher incidence of uses of these uh, KPIs among best practices companies than for all others. And if you look at the, the right side of the screen, uh, you look at just the top three, only three KPIs are being used currently by a majority of all other or industry average organizations compared to the six that the best practices organizations are looking at. But there are many other uh, uh, metrics that are being used and there's a little bit of a mix below that 50% line. Again, um, why do best practices organizations not focus as much on time from product sale to, pro uh, to defect detection or total revenues from extended warranty sales? It's because they've already got those kinds of things in place. They're already increasing their revenues from extended warranty sales. They recognize the importance of that, the benefits that it brings, so they're focusing a little bit less on that. Once you measure something, and it gets to the target that you want it to be and it stays there for a period of time, then you don't have to measure it every month or every quarter or in some cases even every year. You've got it under control and it's going to stay high almost forever. Uh, that's the logic that many best practices organizations use. We've got this under control. We don't really need to measure it all the time as part of our main KPI program. It would be a secondary or uh, um, a periodic update that we would use. So when you look at the KPIs that you're considering to, uh, to use to measure your performance, there are different areas of focus. We look at the customer focus, cost focus, time focus, and revenue focus. And we've looked at some other things that either don't fit into a category or cross over categories. 
The one thing I didn't put in here, though, under customer focus was customer retention. Many companies find it very difficult to measure customer retention, and admittedly, it's significantly more difficult to measure than customer satisfaction. What I would suggest is before you start measuring customer retention, focus on customer satisfaction, and when you have your satisfaction levels high enough, then you can focus a little bit more on the retention. But you're not going to retain a dissatisfied customer. You've got to work on the satisfaction first. So the top uh, warranty management capabilities that are currently in place, in other words, you're taking these actions, you're being driven, you're facing challenges. Um, what are you doing this for? What capabilities are you going to supply to uh, your uh, field technicians, your warranty managers, uh, and your customers? And what we see here is a nice line here, 58% to 79% saying that these five categories are, are among the top capabilities that we currently have in place. That's really good because that's they're very high numbers compared to similar surveys we've done in this and other disciplines. And it focuses mainly on end-to-end -end workflow process to handle claims and returns, to structure warranty management and to integrate it to uh, within all service functions. And that thing that I, I mentioned just a, a few minutes ago about senior executive oversight of all warranty management activities. Now, the other two are important, but I just wanted to focus here on that 71% for senior executive oversight. Whenever we ask that question in all, all of our surveys, there are many segments and many categories and many services disciplines where that 71% just drops down to 48%, 42%. It's not very high at all. Here, best practices organizations have recognized that if we want to be best practices, we need accountability and we need someone making sure that we're towing the line all the time. And that's why these numbers are so high. But there are other capabilities on this next chart that are also high, another five, in fact, that are 50% and higher, cited by um, respondents, best practices respondents, as being currently in place. So these include a, a couple of KPI measurements, uh, but they also include the ability of field techs to review warranty entitlements on each job so they know what they're dealing with before they start dealing with it separate reporting of warranty management financial performance data, and an early warning uh, system for systematic failures. They're looking at all the right things, but there are even more. Uh, and what we see here is between a third and almost a half, a couple more uh, KPI measurements, uh, warranty management operational and financial information being distributed to the appropriate parties within the organization, even outside of the warranty organization. And, of course, the closed-loop warranty management system in place. Why is that capability uh, so low right now? Uh, it's because um, you've got to accomplish everything else before you have a, a fully embodied system completely in place. And uh, even best practices organizations may not be struggling with them, but they're still dealing with them in the same fashion that many uh, of uh, the all other organizations are. But there's even more. There are more being planned in the next 12 months by best practices organizations. We've seen the 33% who presently have a closed loop system in place. Well, we're seeing another 21% who are going to be implementing that in the next 12 months or before the end of this year. So we see a lot of activity here. It's all pointing in the right direction. It's all very positive. So to put things in perspective, and I'm going to go through some of these pretty quickly because you can uh, look at the details uh, when you get a, a copy of the archived um, web the technology applications currently being used by best practices organizations, there are half a dozen here, uh, starting with customer relationship management, warranty management also at 60%, contract management at 52%. These numbers are all higher than we see for all other organizations, and they're higher than what we see in some other of our surveys. There are other technology applications, and the thing that struck me here, though, is even when you get below the 50% line, where less than 50% of best practices organizations are currently using these applications. Why are they not using these applications? Because some of them have some of that functionality already embedded into their customer relationship management or their warranty management programs. Uh, and uh, that's why the numbers below the line might be a little bit lower. But what I'm very encouraged about is 52% say that contract management is an app that we're currently using. That number is not as high for all others, and it's not as high uh, among uh, the respondents to our field service management survey. Uh, so this is the area where it's most important, and this is where it's being mostly used. 
being planned for use over the next 12 months, rather than looking at each one of these uh, in, uh, in a line, let's just look at the array of numbers from 20% down to 0%. There's less technology applications being planned among best practices over the next 12 months because for the most part they've already got these implemented. For example, if, if you're unsure how to interpret these numbers, none of them are planning to implement a customer relationship management program in the next 12 months. Why? Because they've either already got it or they've uh, tapped into other programs, uh, uh, ERP programs or, or something else, uh, a service lifecycle management program that covers that for them. So, the top uses of the collected data, we see uh, very large uses here, almost two-thirds to improve field service processes and the rest to make changes or to improve processes as well. Uh, what we see here are manufacturing changes, purchasing decisions, making changes to the way we purchase things. These are the top uses of the collected data from the KPI programs that they're collecting on this data from. Other key uses are also important and when you look at uh, over a quarter, 28% saying they're using the data to improve depot repair processes, these are also important. So even down to the 16% making changes to product documentation, that's one in six best practices organizations, which is more than um, what we find among the industry average companies that are using this data um, uh, for that purpose. So we see a lot of use out of the data. It's not just to see how good or how bad we've been in the past 12 months, it's to make changes and to affect change within the organization. So what are they getting out of these uh, uh, KPI measurements and all the actions they're taking with respect to KPIs? On average, best practices organizations are attaining a 95% customer satisfaction level, and that's 10 points higher than the industry-wide average from the total survey respondents. That's a significant uptick. And they're averaging 2.2 days in warranty claims processing time. That's less than half. That's three and a third days quicker than all other uh, respondents to the survey. So they are benefiting from this, and I think we've already painted a picture as to how and why uh, they've positioned themselves into a situation where they can make benefits from things like the sales of fees, et cetera, and so forth. So what we've seen, I'll go through this pretty quickly. You'll be able to look at this uh, slide by slide, um, but I wanted to point out warranty claims processing time has improved slightly year over year, but there's that big number, that 78% uh, saying there's been no change. 14% saying it's improved, only 10% it hasn't improved. That's not a very big ratio, so it has improved. For most companies, though, it stayed about the same, but there has been some modest improvement. Reimbursal cycle uh, reimbursement cycle time has declined year over year. It hasn't improved, so this is a, a downturn. We see 58%, no change, only 16% that it's improved and 26% that it's declined. So this is something that uh, needs to be fixed, not only industry-wide, but even among the best practices organizations. When we look at revenues from extended warranty sales, now this is a good number. What we look at here is about half say there's been no change, but more than half say it's increased by 10, maybe up to 24, almost 25%, 53% of them say that this has been the case nobody has cited a decrease in their sales from extended warranties. If you want to take one tactical action from this webinar back home to your office, it would be this. One of the main differentiators between best practices organizations and all others is their ability to sell extended warranty contracts and to benefit from the revenue, the predictable revenue from that. 53% to zero. It doesn't get much better than that. But warranty claims processing costs have also increased over the past 12 months. Pretty much stayed the same for three quarters of the companies, but increased by 19%, decreased by 10. So we've seen uh, a, an increase in claims processing costs. At these levels, this is modest. It might uh, not be anything more than inflation uh, that's uh, causing that. So to wrap everything up, uh, because I, I don't want to go over my time, um, by seeing how well best practices organizations are doing, one would think that they're extremely satisfied with their primary warranty management vendor. They're not though. 60% are at least very satisfied. Only one in six are extremely satisfied. 
and just over a quarter are fairly complacent. They're neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. And one in eight are not very satisfied at all with their primary vendor. So what this says is that despite the fact that they're doing better than everybody else, they're doing better than they were doing last year and better than they were doing the year before, they're still not happy with their current vendor. Their needs are evolving and perhaps their vendor's uh, solutions haven't been evolving. That's something that Rohit will be talking about in just a few minutes. So while there's a ratio of five to one satisfied over dissatisfied, that's really good. And um, uh, But still, uh, to not see that intensity among the 16% extremely satisfied, that should be double or even triple if they were really satisfied and they're not. So what differentiates best practices organizations from all others? There are five things, and I'll put them all on the chart now because I want to go through them fairly quickly. Agile adaptability. You need to adapt not only to changing uh, needs among your customer base and market base, but you have to adapt to changes in technology. You have to adapt to what your competitors are doing. You have to adapt to the economic situation. So uh, you've got to be agile. You've got to be able to move on a dime. And uh, if you move slower than your competitors or slower than your customers' changing needs, then you're going to be left out in the cold. Inventory management is a key component of cost. Cost is one of the, the key components driving the market today. You've got to focus on those areas. Cycle time, this is another main component that differentiates best practices from all others. We've seen that they're getting their claims processed in less than half the time. You've got to work on that too to aspire to best practices. Key performance indicators, that's the foundation that's going to empower your ability to do everything else on this page and everything else uh, in uh, this webcast. Uh, you can't improve if you don't know where you are now uh, and what the uh, actions you're taking are doing to improve where you're going to be a year from now or five years from now. Market position and presence, that's the, the ability to take where you are today to promote all the good things you're doing, uh, the, your ability uh, to measure things, your ability to uh, cut costs back with inventory management, and you take all the good things you're doing from the other factors on this page Everything else you're doing in terms of the processes that you're improving, let the marketplace know it. If you've got users groups, then uh, share that information with them at the users groups. If you have a quarterly newsletter or you regularly send out emails or, or tweets or blogs, make sure you, you promote the things that are important to your customer and your market base. That will improve your overall position. And the key benefits of doing all of this, you're going to get improved revenue streams through the sales of extended warranties increased knowledge and information flow that you can share within the organization, higher levels of customer satisfaction, which will let you start thinking about customer retention and loyalty, reduce costs, reduce losses, improve product and design, there's that collaboration, design for service, and improve financial performance, whether it's the top of the numerator uh, generating revenues, the bottom denominator uh, cutting costs, you're going to attain greater profitability uh, through this and more uh, predictable revenue streams, just like the best practices organizations. So that's my part of the presentation. I'm going to let Rohit uh, follow us up now, and um, he'll be sharing some of the uh, solutions that Tavon has and linking them directly to some of the data that uh, we've been sharing with you. And then we'll be happy to field some Q&A from all of you. So thank you very much. And Rohit, turning it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, hi everyone, this is Rohit. So, as we looked at the presentation from Will, best practice warranty management operations are creating KPI driven programs to improve their operations. Now, use of KPIs to improve operations is a continuous improvement cycle as most of you know. So, one of the things that KPIs help us is to identify improvement areas. And some of the improvement areas that Bill talked about during his presentation included process changes, cutting down cost, selling more extended warranty, and even going down to the path of redesigning your products or redesigning your service offering. So one of the things that stand out when we look at these uses of data is that you need a highly flexible system and a good change management program in place to implement these changes. So that's a key learning from the change management piece is that your IT system should be able to support your changing processes 
It should be able to implement your new rules. It should be able to support any new warranty or service offerings that you want to roll out in the marketplace. Another key thing that we looked at, especially when we talked about the best practices warranty management operations, is their customer focus. So as you can see, uh, customer retention and customer satisfaction are the top priorities for warranty management organizations. Now, not only your business processes need to imbibe this focus, but even your IT system should also help you in achieving this customer focus in your day-to-day -day operation. So instead of looking at your warranty or your service as a standalone system or as a standalone process, you should be looking at the warranty touch points with the customer along with the other interactions to get a 360 picture of your relationship with your customer. So your warranty solution should integrate with your different components of the business to provide you with a 360 view of your customers, allowing your warranty and service team to better serve your customers. Another key thing that Bill talked about during his presentation are some of the challenges that best practices warranty organizations are facing today. And some of these challenges basically talk about how to identify the root cause of failure, high level of you know, no fault found, trying to minimize the cost, improve the cycle times, and so on. Now, these challenges can be easily addressed by keeping track of them using KPIs. So you need to identify the ones that you want to focus on, create your KPIs around those, and start tracking them very closely. Now, to enable those KPIs, your IT system should allow you to capture the data that is required to generate those KPIs. <clears throat> and again, these challenges can also act as a criteria for you to select your uh, best warranty management program. So as Bill was talking about earlier, not like even among best practice warranty organizations, not everyone is satisfied with their warranty management vendor. So we think that some of these challenges are the focus areas that you should use as a criteria when selecting your future warranty management vendor. So for example, your future warranty system should automatically capture the failure information and do warranty term validation. It should also provide you real-time reports to provide you the KPIs that you need. It should have an integrated supplier recovery component for a closed loop warranty management. It should also have integrated reverse logistics to optimize on the part return process. And it should also have a strong BI component to provide insights on how to lower your cost and improve your business processes. So what I've been trying to say is that your warranty management system should be flexible, customer focused, and comprehensive. So that will make you maximize the use of your KPI program by having a system that, that can adapt as you grow within the organization and improve your processes by using your KPI. So now just to quickly talk about uh, what Tavant has to offer. So Tavant has two warranty solutions. The so first one is Tavant Warranty. So Tavant Warranty is a closed loop warranty management platform that we have built in-house using open source technologies. It provides integrated service, warranty, reverse logistics, and supplier recovery management. It is highly configurable. It provides you the comprehensive closed loop functionality all the way from managing your claim initiation till supplier recovery in the same solution. Our seventh warranty system has a modular design so that you can incrementally start using different modules and integrate into your backend IT system as your processes mature with time. The second solution that Tavant launched in the last couple of years is Tavant Warranty on Demand. So Tavant Warranty on Demand is a customer-focused warranty management solution. This solution has been built on top of reliable Salesforce platform to allow an organization to have a 360 view of your customer relationship. So you can run your marketing campaigns, you can generate your leads, you can convert them into actual orders, and manage all your post-sale interactions, be it through customer service or warranty, in the same system. 
So this will definitely help you in improving your customer and satisfaction. Some of the things that Bill talked about that most of the best practice warranty management companies are pursuing in today's market. So the seventh warranty on demand solution is highly configurable. It's very customer focused to so everything that we are doing in this version of our warranty offering revolves around customer. And being built on top of Salesforce platform, it allows for greater social collaboration between different members of your service channel. So that's all we wanted to cover on the webinar today. Thank you for attending the webinar. The webinar playback along with the slides will be available through our website uh, soon within a week or so. And also for the attendees of today's webinar, uh, we will be uh, sending out the complimentary white paper that was written by Bill on today's topic of building best practices warranty management program using KPI. And if you have any more questions or if you want to discuss any of the topics in detail, please feel free to get in touch with us at the warranty conference. Both I and Bill are going to be there and we can talk about items discussed in today's webcast and warranty products from someone in detail. So with that, I will open the webinar for questions. We will start with questions that all have already been asked by the participants. So Bill, the first question I have is, why do you think the reimbursement cycle time for a number of companies have actually increased? Well, there are, there are many reasons for it. Uh, and when you, if you try to come up with a, a mean average reason for why they're increasing uh, across the board, uh, you might uh, uh, find yourself a little bit fooled by uh, uh, by what otherwise would seem logical. Uh, basically, though, know, uh, in today's world, uh, there are uh, increasingly complex uh, logistics uh, uh, operations. Uh, uh, many companies are struggling with trying to find the right vendors to use, the right outside resources. Uh, we covered that in our survey, but we didn't have the um, the, the space to include that in our a presentation today. Uh, so we find many companies that are struggling with um, uh, with that particular area and in, even though it has um, declined somewhat, it's been a, just a modest decline. So it might be an aberration of the economy, might be an aberration of um, the geopolitical environment in some cases. Um, it, it doesn't appear to be a major factor uh, or a major decline, but it, it is something that uh, I'm anticipating and particularly among the best practices organizations, uh, one thing that they're very good at is when they identify a problem, they rally around it and fix it as quickly as they can. So uh, if it is in fact a system-wide problem, then uh, th on a system-wide basis, they're going to be addressing that and overcoming it. Uh, it. It's not a severe problem right now, and I don't really see it getting out of hand. Thank you, Bill. So Bill, next question we have is, was net promoter score considered in any of your surveys? Well, um, all right, net, net promoter score is something that uh, we just conducted a customer satisfaction survey for a, uh, an ITSM uh, software solution company. And we included our version of net promoter score in that. Uh, and they're typically um, easier to address when you're doing a um, a, a survey that identifies who the client is, who, who the uh, the vendor is. Uh, the survey that we just did is entirely independent. Uh, Tavant uh, it was gracious enough to host this webcast, but Tavant uh, had nothing to do with the generation of the questionnaire and the analysis of the data. So there was no single vendor to look at with respect to Net Promoter Score. Uh, so it, we don't have that data from this survey. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. So the next question we have is, uh, when you say that the best practice warranty management organizations are looking at increasing their warranty budget, so does that refer to increase in warranty payout? Or maybe it is due to increase in their overall sales or increase in operational expenses to improve their capabilities and systems? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, the main focus of that question for this respondent base uh, was improving or, or increasing their warranty budget or their annual spend uh, for uh, process improvement uh, as opposed uh, for payouts. So that's something that's uh, more on the uh, financial or economic side. Uh, what we're looking at is what their spend is, uh, uh, particularly for improving their processes, uh, for focusing more attention on the customers, for acquiring new technologies, for taking uh, new or uh, more intense strategic actions or something of that matter. So um, by and large, uh, the, the payouts is, are not included as part of that increased annual spend. That's something that uh, Eric Arnhem and Warranty Week uh, might uh, have some data uh, that would be more in his area. That's not what we focused on in our surveys. Sure. But so the, another question we have is, since customer retention is number one focus of warranty management organizations, has there been any research done with showing the correlation between service experience and customer retention? Well, uh, service experience and customer retention are very closely and directly related, but uh, on a number of different levels, a number of different facets. Uh, first off, you can look at the company itself, and you can look at its reputation, its longevity, the time it's been in the marketplace, uh, and uh, what uh, the perceptions in the market are um, of that company and its performance and experience. But what really drives customer retention is the people that they have to deal with, whether they're claims processors or uh, the field technicians uh, who come out to fix something under warranty. Uh, they're the ones who really carry the load uh, of uh, the transference, if you will, from customer satisfaction to customer retention and ultimately customer loyalty. The research that's been done on customer retention and loyalty uh, is far fewer, uh, far less than what you see in terms of research done on customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction is very easy to define, very easy to measure, and very easy to track. Customer retention, uh, I, I once heard someone say that on the day we close the business, whether I retire or uh, we go out of business, uh, the customers we have on the balance sheets that day are the customers we've retained. Well, of course, that's not the way you want to retain a customer. But uh, just because a customer stays with you doesn't mean that they're happy with you. It might be that you're uh, perceived by them to be the lesser of the evils between you and other organizations. So the experience is a direct um, a component and directly correlated to customer retention. But uh, you have to uh, show the levels of experience and reputation and quality and professionalism, both on the macro side from uh, the corporate perspective, but also on the personal or micro side from each individual uh, contact person that a customer or a prospect has to deal with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, and by the way, uh, Rohit, I, I wanted to mention uh, for all of the uh, participants who are also going to be at the Warranty Chain Management Conference uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to be presenting a keynote there, but I'm also conducting a workshop where we talk about the specific relationship between uh, customer satisfaction and customer retention. So if you are at the conference, be sure to stop by the Tavant booth, of course, but also uh, see about attending my workshop, and, uh, and I'll be... Uh, uh, visiting the Tavant booth from time to time and be able to, to field some of your questions there as well. Thank you, Bill. So, Bill, we have uh, one more question in the interest of time. So, sure. who was the respondent in terms of the roles or the position of the people who responded to these surveys? Okay. Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, normally, uh, when we uh, make our, our longer presentations, uh, uh, in an hour and a half, a couple of hours, we, we show the whole uh, respondent base. Uh, basically, uh, there were between 75 and 80 percent of the respondents who were in management or director levels. Uh, there only were um, about um, 15 percent or so, uh, plus or minus, that were in uh, the uh, middle management uh, area. But uh, typically, uh, it's, we target our surveys to the C level the director level and the management level, and we typically get between 75% and 80% responses from those sectors, and uh, we, we got the same here uh, among the best practices organizations as well. Thank you, Bill.
Uh, so we are at the end of our one hour. Thank you everyone for taking your time today to attend the webinar. As mentioned, we will be sending out a copy of the white paper written by Bill on the same topic. And if you are attending the warranty conference, please feel free to get in touch with me or Bill about our discussion uh, topic today 